going out there yo 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 what's going on we are live if you're watching this then you probably know by now that the last video just went out yesterday uh, about travis walton and honestly it's one of those cases where I know it so well because I, as I said in the video, I had met Travis Walton once at a restaurant in Phoenix, Arizona, um, after watching him give like a three hour talk at this MUFON meeting. MUFON stands for the Mutual UFO Network, uh, and they have like little groups basically in every large city. And monthly they do things like bring in speakers, like people who've experienced or investigated UFOs. Uh, and they talk about it. So on this particular day, Travis Walton was on stage speaking. Um, I'll be honest, one of my first observations going to this MUFON meeting uh, really surprised me because when I went, I assumed that a lot of the people who were there were going to be... Uh, can you guys hear me all right, by the way? Uh, real quick, I want to make sure as we're getting going that Everything's working properly. But uh, one of the things that surprised me is I assumed that everybody that was at the MUFON meeting was probably going to be, you know, in their 20s, 30s, maybe 40s, but maybe 40s at the highest. When I went, I was so shocked to realize that not only was I an outlier for the average age, age of the group, um, but the average age was probably like 55 plus. Uh, that, that shocked me. Anyways, um, Travis Walton, as I said in the video, after I met him, uh, I asked him a question and I don't even remember the question I asked, but he basically was like, man, I just wish this whole thing never happened to me. And I was like, that's like a mic drop moment. I don't even know <laughs> what to make of that statement. But if anything, I think it just showed me that this is not a guy who was necessarily trying to hoax something for fame. Uh, he wasn't doing this for a profit. I know he made some royalties on the on the Hollywood movie that was made off of his life, but as he should, because after this whole thing went down, um, he lost his job in the immediate aftermath, and so did a lot of the people uh, who were witnesses um, to him getting abducted by this flying saucer. So if you haven't seen the video by now, you definitely need to go and watch the Travis Walton video, uh, either after this or, um, you know, before this, I would actually recommend now that you're here, you might as well watch it after if you haven't seen it already. Um, this is kind of like, uh, what I did when I had first heard of the James Fox movie moment of contact, where he investigated the Virginia Brazil case. Um, they were talking. So he was on Joe Rogan and he was talking about, you know, this UFO crash crashing in Virginia, Brazil, and then this alien being was running around town for a couple of days. And then these military guys picked it up and took it with them or whatever into their car. Anyways, I heard the story about it as he was talking about it on the podcast, which made me appreciate the movie even more when I finally watched it. So if you haven't seen the video, watch it after this live stream. Uh, but if you have, I'm curious to know what your thoughts were on it. For me, uh, real quick, I'll just do a quick summary. Basically, uh, Travis Walton, he was a lumberjack working in a seven-man crew out in the middle of a, a forest called Sit Greaves National Forest, which is located in northern Arizona. So if you're not from Arizona and you've heard like, oh, Arizona is hot, it's in the desert or whatever, um, I live in Phoenix and the Scottsdale area, right? This is like classically what most people think of as like, the big city in phoenix obviously i think it's like one of the top five largest cities in the u.s anyways northern arizona if you just drive two hours north um it gets really cold to where you know flagstaff you can get snow up there for most of the year so um very different climates depending on where you're at in arizona so snowflake arizona is where travis walton is from it's in northern arizona and i wonder why they call it snowflake because it gets pretty cold cold up there so anyways they're out in the middle of the forest they're cutting down trees all day um they start driving out of the forest at night and they worked like into the night to where they literally couldn't see anything anymore because you know on that particular 
particular day they were running a little bit behind schedule on like how many trees they needed to cut down or whatever. So they just worked all day. So anyways, as they were driving out, the sun was basically already down. And that's when they see this light in the trees um, somewhere off in the distance. Um, so for them, keep in mind that even though they're in a remote part in the middle of this rainforest or not rainforest, I guess just forest uh, cutting down trees all day, you know, other than the occasional hunter, they don't expect to see anybody out there. Um, and so when they see that, their first immediate thought is, oh, it's probably a forest fire because that's something you would experience, experience out in the forest. Um, but it just didn't seem consistent with looking like a forest fire because the light seemed like it was kind of hovering ab above the ground a little bit, if that makes sense. Not just like all emanating from the ground up there. Uh, some other people suggested maybe it was a plane crash or maybe it's the moon. Um, but anyways, none of the logical things you would think it would be really truly satisfied what this the source of this, these lights were. I mean, it was too bright to be headlights or anything like that. So they drove towards it to investigate. And as they got towards it and really close to it, um, the trees opened up to this clearing where this flying saucer was just hovering there silently, not making any noise. And it was like, as Travis Walton described, I believe he said, it was both both reflecting light and emanating light at the same time. Uh, so it was like, I just imagined this brilliantly bright, metallic, smooth, sleek flying saucer just hovering there. Um, so Travis Walton, who wanted to get up close to this thing, uh, just started running towards it. Like he hopped out of their truck where all seven men were, all seven men were crammed into, uh, and he just started running towards it. Um, so he just assumed that if I run towards it, it's going to zip off, uh, and, and that'll be the end of it. But as he was running towards it, he realized it wasn't moving. And what was freaking him out along with the guys in the, in the truck is the closer Travis got to this thing as he was running towards it. Um, it started to emanate this really intense sound that was like this electrical hum. But as like Travis literally said in the video, um, basically the hum was so low to where you felt the vibration and also had this element of highs to it to where you almost heard it inside of your head rather than through your ears or something like that. Like I just imagine this otherworldly sound uh, that's getting more and more intense that you can feel in your body. Uh, the closer he got to this thing. So as he was eventually literally just like in a crouched position, like not knowing what's going to happen next inches away from this, like he could have reached up and touch it. Um, he started to run away. And as soon as he started running away, the thing zapped him with a beam of light. And the, apparently the beam of light was so bright that it lit up the forest. Like it was basically daylight and um, it levitated Travis in the air and then flung him off like 20 feet or something. So understandably, there's a lot to process there. If you're just a dude watching this whole thing go down with one of your coworkers as you guys are driving out of the tr truck and this dude fucking jumped out of the <laughs> out of the truck and started running towards it. It's like, dude, get back here. And so um if you're just like a guy who maybe works with Travis, but doesn't really know him that well, it's like, holy shit, let's get out of here right now. Um, so that's exactly what they did. They peeled off in the truck. They started driving away. Um, and eventually once they, you know, got maybe a mile or two away, their senses kicked in and they were like, we can't just leave Travis there. If he's still out there, they assumed like his, since he was flung off that, this thing just like zapped him and killed him and his body was laying there. And so they're like, we got to go back and we got to get Travis. Uh, doesn't matter what happened to him. We can't just leave him there. Cause if there was a chance that he was still alive, um, if, if the, the blast from this beam didn't kill him, then the hypothermia definitely would have. So, uh, they went back expecting to find Travis, uh, but much of their surprise, not only was the flying saucer gone, but also Travis's body was too. Um, so that's where the plot thickens because now you got to put yourself in their shoes. It's like, okay, did we just watch our friend get killed? And if he did, 
Did they take his body? Did he get vaporized? Like, what the hell happened to him? And so they go into town, Snowflake, Arizona, uh, and they tell the local sheriff. And I'm assuming this is like a really small town. So the local sheriff is probably someone who maybe they indirectly knew just because they were all living in this tiny town. Um, so they go to the sh tell the sheriff what's going on. I mean, how do you even begin to explain what happened to a police officer who you don't even know if he's going to believe in UFOs or not? And so when they tell him the story, they all have the same story. Um, the police officer could clearly tell that they were all shaken up by something. So something very traumatic happened to all of them, but he didn't quite know what it was. So he thought maybe they were on drugs. He thought maybe, uh, maybe they hurt Travis and left him for dead. Maybe they conspired to kill Travis. Um, either way, he started treating it immediately like a, a missing persons investigation, um, not necessarily taking their story at face value. Um, so they had a search party. They went out. They looked for Travis. Um, nothing. They didn't find any DNA, a fucking shoe, a fingerprint, or I don't know that you'd find fingerprints in the forest, but uh, you know, nothing, not a footprint or anything. And so, um, they were really confused. They were baffled. They had dogs and everything sniffing. Um, and it really led to nothing. And so not knowing what to do, the police officer, the sheriff obviously wanted to get to the bottom of it. So he was basically like, yo, um, if you guys are telling the truth, then I want you guys to go undergo a lie detector test to prove it. And so they did. They all passed the lie detector test. I'm making this a brief summary of the story. Um, and the plot thickened. And they were still trying to almost coerce these guys into co to a confession. Like, listen, if you just tell us what you did with Travis's body, we can end this whole thing right now. This whole clown show that's going on. Because by this time, the story is getting picked up in the media. Man gets taken off by UFO friends uh being convicted of murder for hiding his body like this is a media frenzy it's like going viral before the internet was a thing and so um you know the guys are really stressed out they think they're really gonna get into some serious trouble here um and then that's when it happens uh november 10th so literally the anniversary of this was like a week and a half ago uh november 10th travis walton returns and basically what happened is he just woke up lying in the street and uh, saw this like hovering craft above him and it just zipped off into space. And so he kind of recognized where he was, but he was really shaken up because he had apparently lost consciousness after getting beamed by this thing five days before. And now the next thing he knows, he's waking up in the street and it's five days later. He doesn't even know it's five days later at this point. And so um, he he goes over to a local payphone because, like I said, he was familiar with the town. It's a small town. So there were some payphones down the road. He went and I got this detail wrong in the script of the video uh, just because depending on what source you look at, um, uh, they there might be conflicting details for the smaller details that aren't necessarily crucial to this story but uh in the video i said he used this change that was in his pocket um that he still had the spare change that he still had in his pocket to place a phone call to call his brother apparently what had happened is he actually you call he used a collect call to uh call his phone call his brother in the middle of the night um and a collect call if you're not Maybe if you're Gen Z and you don't even know what a payphone is, uh, a collect call is basically you press zero uh, and on a payphone and it calls the operator and you ask the operator, can I place a collect call to so-and-so phone number? Um, and basically the person who answers the phone has to agree to paying like a dollar or something to answer the phone call. So it's something you really only want to be doing as a last resort if you absolutely have to at a at a at a payphone. Um so anyways, that's how we got a hold of his brother. What's interesting about that that one little detail um that I ended up getting wrong in the in the video was um the operator 
had obviously heard about what was going on with Travis Walton. Um, she recognized the name. So when this guy says, Hey, I'm Travis Walton, I want to call my brother or whatever. She listens in to the entire phone call that Travis had with his brother and, uh, notified the sheriff, uh, and the police to come check out the payphone Cause Travis Walton just placed a collect call. You're never going to believe this because he's been missing for five days, presumably dead and murdered. And so, um, Long story short, uh, Travis gets a hold of his brother, eventually is able to convince his brother, like, this is actually Travis. It's not some dude prank calling you. I'm not making this up. Uh, and so Dwayne, his brother, comes, picks him up. Uh, and, and what's also really interesting about the fact that the operator notified the police is that shortly after Travis was picked up, and his brother took him to a hospital. The police got there like 10 minutes later and started investigating the phone booth, you know, taking fingerprints and whatnot. And so this thing was thoroughly investigated top to bottom simply because the entire time Travis was gone, people assumed that he was dead and murdered. And as these six guys just made up this crazy UFO story to uh, get away with murder. And so, um, you know, this really put this whole thing on a, on another twist. And if you thought this thing was going viral in the 1970s already, imagine the fucking wild fire of news media attention. This got once Travis returned and corroborates the same story that these other guys were saying, which is he was abducted by a flying saucer in the forest with his coworkers. Uh, I mean, the whole thing is just like so far fetched, right? So anyways, without getting into too many of the nitty gritty details that I want to save for the video that you guys get into, um, Travis passes a few lie detector tests corroborating the story. He undergoes hypnotic regression to be able to recall a lot of these memories without um, the, feeling the stress of the moment because, I mean, he's processing everything in real time from the fact that, hey, you've been gone for five days. I know you feel like you it was only a couple hours, but it was literally five days. Um, also what the hell happened to you? Turns out Travis only remembered like 20 minutes worth of the five days, but every time he would try to recall what happened, um, the dude just started having a panic attack, like, because it was such a traumatic experience to process, uh, what happened. And so what's interesting about this is maybe you've heard of the story or if this sounds familiar to you, um, it sounds like the plot of a, of a famous Hollywood movie that came out in the 90s called Fire in the Sky. Well, if you didn't know already, Fire in the Sky is a close, it is the movie that's based on the story of Travis Walton. And I've obviously researched the story and I've also now made a video about it. Um, and also I've seen the movie and what I can tell you is that the movie got the details to the letter, exactly how you would imagine it in your head going down, like to the letter, uh, specifically even like using the same location and everything. And so really good movie because the story kind of sells itself. Um, but the one thing that the movie got wrong, and it's not that they didn't know they got it wrong. They did this intentionally is what happened to Travis Walton while he was gone because he was able to re to recollect these memories under hypnotic regression and the story about what happened to him on the ship is just absolutely bananas um and it's also very trippy and so um i'm going to save for the specific details for what happened in that experience for the video because it's kind of the climax of the video uh is that specific part but uh essentially the movie if you've seen the movie but you don't yet know what actually happened to him um the movie got it wrong to where they made it more of like a, a scary monster alien movie so uh every detail was exactly uh as it happened in the real story, except for when Travis wakes up on the ship, what happens on the ship, uh, the movie just, in my opinion, it didn't even work. You know, I think it would have been even better if they closely modeled what happened to him on the ship. Um, and, and that's a whole other rabbit hole to go down on its own, because I think what happened to him on the ship is far more fascinating 
than what was displayed in the movie, which was essentially just this monster of an alien that was like attacking him and the walls were filled with goo and shit. Uh, what actually happened on on the ship, I think would have been far more fascinating from a, a movie standpoint. Um, but you, you got to think, you know, Hollywood has been, especially like Close Encounters of the Third Kind uh, is one of those first movies that was like the number one movie that was essentially based on a lot of Project Blue Book uh, files and cases. Uh, and they actually got these government Blue Book people like J. Allen Hynek to come and consult on the movie and everything. And so the government has had a hand, at least in my opinion, uh, due to different connections and, and people coming out and saying these connections. Um, they've had a hand at almost like a slow release of information regarding UFOs and some of the reality around it. But also because of that, they have the ability to hide little details that may be important if true. And so you almost wonder why would they take such a, a weird twist in the movie to where the one thing they change is pr arguably the most fascinating part of the story. Um, maybe because what happened on the ship and the specific two different types of beings that were experienced uh or that he met or interacted with on this craft two like different species where they don't even look remotely the same um these are species that have been talked about in ufo lore going back uh into any of the do documents and whistleblowers that have been coming out since the 1940s um and that's specifically an involvement of the gray aliens and the nordic aliens and so uh i would almost assume that if we think that the government has a hand in crafting the narrative that mainstream movies and entertainment are, are able to put out regarding this stuff maybe there's an element of that that they wanted to keep secret for potentially national national security purposes um, and I only say that because if you've seen my Antarctica video, um, I believe it's the Antarctica one where it talks about Nazis, uh, essentially reverse engineering, uh, crash flying saucer, uh, also uh, through other occult means, um, be being able to, uh, essentially, you know, get information and blueprints about flying craft and um all these what they would call wonder nazi wonder weapons um almost like remote view i mean this is a long story so i'm just trying to like not get into it but basically they use like remote viewing and telepathy to get in contact with these beings from a place called aldebar aldebarian which is like a star system um where they essentially sent this chick maria orsic um blueprints to a, a working flying saucer and so the parts of that flying saucer were made up of a nuclear type of reactor which involved spinning red mercury inside of a centrifuge um the technology is theoretically possible with torsion physics but is um uh, unknown the specific details of it now i will say uh, blueprints of these things have been found after world war ii when they were going through nazi documents um, so that's where a lot of these ideas come from, but something called Dyke lock, which is German for the bell, um, was like an acorn shaped thing that was thought to be like the, the, the propulsion source for these, uh, flying saucers, which they called Hanabu craft. Anyways, this is all along the, the UFO lore of uh, basically Nazis escaping the end of world war II, getting away, fleeing to South, uh, South America, uh, but also to uh, Antarctica. Um, and if you really follow the legend behind that line of history, uh, essentially what people believe is that Antarctica was used as a base that the Nazis had created. And because of their far superior flying craft, they eventually figured out how to weaponize them. And then you look into things like uh, Object or <laughs> Operation High Jump, where a whole military fleet from America went down to Antarctica, essentially came back with their tail between their legs, having lost half, <laughs> like a bunch of their men and a bunch of their uh, ships and craft because of these flying saucers that can fly pole to pole with incredible speed, basically attacked them. Um, 
so a lot of people think those were the nazis not necessarily aliens and you know it, because of the secrecy of around antarctica altogether um that's what leads to a lot of people really starting to believe this stuff well like i said if you follow that line of thinking down uh the nazis use that as a jumping point to go to um basically the moon to mars not saying i believe any of this but i'm just telling you the story going to mars and essentially having a secret space force which is which is basically them joining forces with the advanced uh reptilians or whatever uh, and having fleets of people out in space just doing space missions like star troopers type shit and uh, what really gets fascinating about about maybe evidence that would corroborate a secret space force existing is when you look into another one of my earliest videos about uh, fuck, what was his name the guy who hacked uh, NASA and found evidence and photos of a secret space force he found a list of names of uh uh basically off planet officers like what the hell and he's been fighting a legal battle where basically they're trying to extradite they tried to extradite him to the u.s so they could lock him up and silence this guy um and he fought that and was not extradited um so lots of interesting connections uh I kind of went off on a long tangent again. I told you this is why I did not want to go off on the tangent of Nazi Wonder Woman Wonder Weapons because I would have gotten off to off topic with the Travis Walton story. Um, but basically, yeah, Travis Walton story, very fascinating. So if you haven't seen the video, make sure you check it out after this live stream. But uh, let me check out some of the comments because I've seen them rolling in a little bit. Uh, let's see, Roman. I from Tampa. Uh, all right. I would love to hear more about the holographic map of the stars Travis came across that activated when he placed his hands on the controls. That would be amazing to see the rendition of. Um, yeah. So I didn't really get into the details of that specific detail uh, too much in the video. Uh, I might have briefly glazed over it. But basically, while he was on the ship, he. Uh, eventually like walked into this room because he was trying to like get out of this thing when he eventually came to um and he could see if you remember from the video there was like this scene where you just saw these stars so it's almost like the walls of this thing were transparent like it was all a window that was like a one-way window right so he could tell that they were in space because he could see all these stars around him and he didn't know if it was like him actually looking at the stars or if it was like, as you said, like a holographic projection, because uh, essentially everything looks so alien, so foreign while he was in there. It was hard to make sense of any of it. But, you know, it had the basics like, oh, that's clearly a table like, oh, the, those are clearly some controls and buttons over there. Right. And so he goes over and starts fucking with some of these controls, thinking like maybe it'll open a door for him to like get out of this thing and go home or something. And uh, because at this point, he still is trying to figure out what's going on. Like there's a part of him that thinks he might just be in the hospital and he's like tripping balls or something. Right. So basically he, um, puts his hands on these controls. And as soon as he started ma manipulating them, he could see this, like the stars, like all rotating really quickly. So it's almost like he was either rotating this holographic proje projection of these stars or, they were physically just zipping around space that fast if he was like manipulating with the driver's seat controls um it's unknown and i don't even think he knew so the source of that part of the story is obviously from travis walton's recollection of everything but um you know i don't think this is something he necessarily studied and was like trying to learn how it works in the moment given that he had just been struck by a bright beam of light was feeling weak was probably in a lot of pain, was still coming into consciousness, uh, met these freaking weird beings. There's a lot going on. So I, I think some of the little details you can understand he probably didn't make note of. <laughs> uh, like when I turned it this way, it did this. And I noticed that this button does this. There was probably none of that. Right. And so um, that's all I know about that. Uh, you know, but I think, I think unfortunately, like, Fortunately and unfortunately, Travis Walton 
one to my knowledge is still alive to this day uh seemingly doing well for for his age obviously i think he's in his 80s or something or close to it at least uh but what i've noticed and, and i've only noticed this because i saw him at the mufon meeting that i was telling you guys about but i also um i also saw him on the joe rogan podcast and my impression of him both times was that I didn't think he was that good at telling his own story because by that point I knew enough of the details um, from interviews he had done years and years prior. And I think as time has gone on and the the older that he's gotten, uh, he's not as quick on the ball when it comes to uh, verbalizing his thoughts. Uh, he's a lot he speaks a lot slower these days. That his thoughts maybe might be a little bit more jumbled these days but if you watch him like on larry king like 30 years ago that little clip that i included in the video you could tell he's like a lot a lot more quick-witted he's a he's almost like a politician and how well spoken he is at, at the time and so um fortunately that he's still alive unfortunately that his recollection of everything even today is probably you know all these years later uh, is probably going to you're probably going to start losing a lot of some of the finer details that he might have remembered 30 years ago uh like hey what when you picked up this thing like what did it look like what was it like could you tell what it was because he picked up some random object and so started swinging it at these beings trying to fend him off like he he might not remember all the little details like that like what was what did it feel like how how big was it approximately could you tell what it was made of um but I think what's most fascinating about everything, and, and this is kind of one of the points that was made in the video, is that if you only took the data from the lie detector tests that everyone passed, the multiple ones that they all took, uh, and also some of the physical evidence that they found at the site of the abduction, if you only if you only took what is directly in front of your eyes as evidence, this would still be the most well documented case of alien abduction and potentially proof of alien abduction of all time. Um, and, and that's not an understatement to say, I mean, I almost think of Travis Walton and alien abduction as synonymous terms at this day, at this, to this day. Right. Uh, and that's also kind of something that's unfortunate because this has been something that has haunted Travis for his entire life. Ever since that moment, I believe he was 22 when this all went down. And so I'm, in my 30s right now i can't imagine having spent the last 10 plus years or whatever um being the guy who's crazy who gets abducted by aliens and no matter what you say and what you experience some people believe you some people don't but regardless this guy can't maintain a steady job he can barely get anybody to hire him because he's travis walton the guy who got abducted by ufos who maybe if you are someone who's so skeptical that you can't bring yourself to believe anything paranormal or out of the ordinary uh or extraterrestrial if you're so shut off to any of those ideas no matter how good of a person you are you can still be shut off to those types of things no matter what travis does in your eyes he is a liar right because you don't believe in those things and so um it was a very polarizing moment for travis's life and it's been a legacy he hasn't been able to shake and i kind of understand why he might feel all these years later that he just wishes this whole thing never happened to him because it essentially robbed him of what could have been an otherwise very normal life you know um but you know let me know what you guys think if you guys agree with that uh mt motors lol not sure what that means uh to be honest with you i've seen a couple of mysterious things in my neighborhood uh where's your neighborhood located like i don't need an actual address but like are you in upstate new york are you in brazil are you in the uk like where are you and uh what have you seen and i think this also goes into where maybe some of my skepticism comes out because whenever someone tells me if that they've seen a, a ufo which surprisingly happens more often to me in the last six to eight months then probably ever in my life where i've probably met like at least five different people who have adamantly claimed that they've seen a ufo and this is a 
this is just a point that I made uh, on my last live stream, which is, okay, if I'm really being logical about this, because, I mean, if you talk to the majority of people in your life, guarantee none of them have seen a UFO, right? So you got to take that as like, okay, what is the probability of someone actually seeing a UFO? For every 100 people, what's the probability that at least one of them has seen a UFO? I, I would say, if you... I would say my guess is that maybe one out of 5,000 people have genuinely seen a UFO. Now, if you take a large city or something, that's obviously like a, a decent handful of people. But that also tells you that ha have I actually met 5,000 people? And, and this is all just a guess, right? Have I actually met 5,000 people in the last six months? No, I haven't. Nowhere close, right? So of how many people have I met in the last five, six months? I don't know, maybe two, 300, if we're being genu like generous, but uh, what are the chances that I meet five, six people out of two or 300 who have adamantly claimed that, that they've seen a UFO and they're all being truthful? I think in, in a group of that size, the chances are at least one of them is making it up or at least one of them saw something that maybe they couldn't explain, but it doesn't necessarily mean it was extraterrestrial. Does that make sense? So this is where I start to play the game of probability in my head. Um, and it's all just a matter of opinion because the probability in my head is based off the fact that prior to maybe six months ago when people realized I had a, a channel about this, I had never met people or that many people who had really genuinely seen a ufo most people that i have talked to prior to uh, starting this youtube channel kind of like zone out and lose interest when you bring it up because you they almost think that you know you're crazy or something if you bring up ufos or something like that and uh you know so i'm just playing the probability game here not to say that i don't believe in ufos obviously i believe i believe in ufos or i wouldn't have uh made as many videos about it as i have uh, but i've never seen one Right. I'm just looking at the evidence. And more importantly, I'm conveying the stories that I find very intriguing and interesting, you know, and, and I think that's if we're just talking about the YouTube channel for a second, probably the one thing that I value the most about this YouTube channel is that um, the way I've kind of, I guess, branded it and even the intentional way that I've not necessarily only done videos about UFO sightings or only done videos about uh, you know, leaked documents or whatever. I've done a handful of videos on, you know, a variety of different things. That's intentional because I think what's most important to me or something, I guess, just that I enjoy most about this YouTube channel is that these are just stories that I find mind blowing, right? Kind of very fitting for the name, uh, of the channel, right? So if I find these stories mind blowing, or if I find them very fascinating for one reason or another, it's something that I would like to convey, right? And so that doesn't mean that I want to do every video about UFOs. It just happens to be one of those things that as of today is a very trending topic because a lot of new information is coming out about it. But also there's so many fascinating stories within the UFO phenomenon. Um, and I think one of the most fascinating things about the UFO phenomenon to me is that if you look into it, the more you look into it, the more you realize that it kind of tries to take credit for literally every conspiracy you've ever heard of. I promise you, there are people or pockets of the internet who believe every conspiracy you've ever heard of is connected to UFOs somehow. And they probably can point out very compelling stories and reasons and anecdotes and pieces of evidence connecting all these theories to ufos and that's what's the most fascinating thing about it you know um i was actually just listening to dave grush on joe rogan's podcast prior to me starting this live stream if you haven't heard it i think it just came out today uh finally joe rogan had david grush on his podcast and one of the things that dave grush kind of admitted that he believes is the fact that he thinks extraterrestrials created or accelerated evolution of 
uh, homo sapien to create the intelligent beings that we are today. And they kind of started talking about that. Joe was talking about how, you know, that makes sense because there's nothing like us. Like he, like it, they actually have started to realize that it seems like the, the apes to, as of today have just entered the stone age because they're starting to use tools and spears and stuff uh for their everyday uses uh and that's something that's fascinating because it kind of shows that they're evolving at least consciously to some degree uh and, and so the fact that we are so different and so accelerated in that evolution um it was a fascinating part of the conversation right but bringing it back to how everything may or may not be connected to ufos i mean if that is actually legitimately true and it's also something that ironically was hit on very brief briefly in my video about uh nukes and ufos um a couple of videos ago at the end of that video um i show an interview with linda moulton howe uh, an investigative reporter from time files or something like that uh <laughs> I don't remember her exact website, but um, she basically was shown this document that was confirmed to have been a real document, but also potentially had disinformation spread throughout it. Um, one of the details was that humans were created as a genetic experiment by extraterrestrials. Um, and, and so that, that's fascinating. And so, you know, if, if, that's, if that's true, then it would make sense why every conspiracy may tie back to the UFO conspiracy because, um, you know, that's the source of everything, right? If, it, if the aliens created humans. And I don't even know that I necessarily believe it, but it seemed like David Grush uh, felt that of the explanations of our universe and where humans came from, it seemed to me like that was something he believes the most after whatever he may or may not have seen right i mean there's a lot of people who still question the the i guess validity of his claims um given me included like i think a lot of people really question you know can we really trust what this guy is saying because he's not experienced seeing a ufo he's never seen any of these biologics that he claims exist and he's never seen hardly anything that is actually related to the phenomenon as far as i can tell he is simply a guy like you and i who's looked into this shit but he also happens to hold high clearances in in the government and so if that's the case yeah i mean there's probably you would want to question the validity of these claims if i was someone who was sitting behind this camera right now talking about the shit that I talk about and I had a high clearance level in the military and I was using that as my authority trigger to make people believe me. Um, yeah, people would rightly be able to question the validity of my claims. Right. So I think a lot of it is just the fact that he's talking about this without ever having witnessed or seen anything himself. Everything he's saying is just secondhand hearsay. Uh, which is essentially that everything that you and I are, are saying on these videos, right? Because it's all just the story. And, and that's the thing that I ultimately relate is the story, the fascinating aspects of it. I don't even know if I believe half the shit, but if I can just get the story out, it's fascinating enough. It's fun. It's entertaining, but it also gives you the ability to start to form your own opinions. And I think that's the most fascinating aspect about this stuff because half these stories are so interesting to me that I'm like, how has nobody made a movie about this or something? And I think, uh, you know, the fact that they're all based on potential truth is very fascinating. <laughs> uh, Walton hated the movie. Yes, I believe he did. Um, you know, I think I've seen I've, I've seen him talk about hating the movie. I've also seen him talk about, you know, getting royalties or, you know, actually wanting people to see the movie. I think the part that he hated was the the way that they portrayed what happened to him on the ship. And understandably so. I mean, it was 
one, not as fascinating. Two, kind of like anticlimactic. I mean, it maybe I'm just a harsh critic of horror movies, but I just thought it sucked, <laughs> you know. Um, but there are uh apparently a group of people out there who like that style of uh, of horror film. I don't. Uh so I didn't find it very fascinating. So I would understand why why he uh didn't like the movie, but um yeah, I you know what's funny is I've actually taken the the mental approach to my videos on this YouTube channel just because there's so much work that goes into every single video to where it's almost like every video is such like a daunting project to where like I'm like, am I really going to be able to pull this off? Um, but because of that, I think the intention I want to be felt from a viewer standpoint in every video, the attention to detail, the attention to the storyline, the attention to how fascinated I am with the story as I'm relaying it to you. Uh, I think I almost think of my videos as like movies that I've put out. And it's like, you know, when, when Quentin Tarantino releases a new film, the title card on the movie says, the ninth Quentin Tarantino film or whatever, right? This is like the last video I put out was like the 27th Patrick James mind fucked video. You know, like it feels like a big event to me every time I release one um, to where literally yesterday before this went live, I, I felt like I was like a giddy child the night before going to Disney World or something. Like I was really excited to put this out just because this has been something that a video that has been being worked on for the last month. Um, and the video that comes out either next week or the week after is a video that's been being worked on for like two, three weeks. Right. Uh, and so now I'm starting to hopefully get, uh, on a roll with some of these videos to where we'll be able to start hitting that weekly or bi-weekly bi -weekly mark. But, uh, you know, a little look behind the scenes. I mean, that's been one of the biggest challenges for most of this year and even last year, uh, is that, you know, if you've been following my mind fucked channel from the beginning at the beginning of last year, you know, that first video I made in my opinion was one of the funnest videos to make on the channel. Uh, and it was the first one. And I think, you know, that video is something that it was like, not that long. It was like maybe six, seven minutes long or something like that. But it was something that I made in like two, three days and just put out for the sake of creative fulfillment or whatever. And surprisingly, it received a really good reaction on social media to where my subscribers started growing almost immediately. Um, not by tens of thousands, but maybe by a hundred or 200 every time I put out a video just from people coming over from TikTok and Instagram. And so uh, one of my goals in 2022 was everybody was like, you know, in the comments, because I try to think about the direction of how to make these videos better every time. And so uh, basically people were like, man, I just wish your videos were longer. I wish your videos were longer. So um, it really forced me to challenge myself to be like, okay, how can I put out videos that are of this nature on a consistent basis, but now make them twice as long? <laughs> and what I found was um, you know, I got better and better at the process as I went and, you know, now that I'm like almost two years into the channel, which makes me kind of anxious to say, because I wish I would have put out maybe double the amount of videos I have, but you know, that kind of brings me back on track with the story, which is when I tried to double the length of these videos, it doubled the production time of the editing of the video, but also the amount of research that went into the video to where like three, four videos in, I was like, I got to start writing these fucking scripts out because I'm going to forget all these details if I'm just going off the top of the dome. And so now I had to add writing a script to the part of the, the pre-production process. And then it also doubled the, the length of the editing process. And so at this point, you know, I've essentially gone all in maybe within the last few months to where I hired an editor. I'm make busting out scripts as quickly as possible uh to where hopefully we can start having more of these 
uh, videos coming out on a more consistent basis that are of the length that I I want them to be, which is around 15 to 20 minutes. And so, um, I guess for some of you who may or may not have been actually just interested, you know, that's kind of like a history of the progression of this channel. And so you'll see like when I eventually posted my first video this year, it was the Sphinx video. That one went wild. I mean, it took a week, but after a week, it like went crazy viral. Like where most of my videos were averaging maybe five to 10 K views <clears throat> that video, um, just like got picked up by the YouTube algorithm and within the month got like hit 2 million views or whatever. Uh, and, and that really grew the channel to what it is now. But I use that as an opportunity to invest myself, my time and my energy into a video I felt needed to be made, but also a video I knew was going to take a lot of effort. And that was the MLK documentary that I released. Um, that video took me six months to create. It ended up not being a 20 minute video, which I should have just been like, how can I make a 20 minute version of this so I can get it out sooner? But it was almost like the more I looked into that story, the specifically the conspiracy behind who shot Martin Luther King. Um, when I looked into that story, the more I looked into it, to it the deeper the rabbit hole went. It, I mean, it goes so deep in so many fascinating directions that if you started looking into it and if I really tried to include all of it, the video could have easily been two and a half hours instead of an hour and 16 minutes. It actually took a lot of effort to cut it down to an hour and 16 minutes from what it very well could have been. Um, and so because YouTube is not necessarily a platform that uh, favors episodic content to where it's like part one part two part three or whatever um you know i just figured we got to put it we gotta if we're gonna put out anything and when i say we i mean i because i wrote the thing i filmed the thing i edited the thing i created the thumbnail and then i uploaded it right so uh the mlk documentary if i'm gonna put this shit out um one it has to be one video because of that it can't be four hours long uh, cause that would just make it take a year to put out instead of six months. And, uh, yeah. So anyways, when I put that video out, I was hoping to, to leverage the success of the Sphinx video into me just taking that as an opportunity to put out a video that I'd essentially wanted to make for like two and a half years. Uh, so if you haven't seen that video, like go check it out. I'd be very grateful because I think of all the stories on my channel, I think, honestly, that one and the Sphinx one are two of the most fascinating, like two of my favorites on the channel, um, which also brings me into the fact that, you know, as this channel grows, I want to be able to um, post some more like fascinating true crime stories like uh, I'm doing one about OJ Simpson uh, here in the near future. That one is also a very fascinating story because he definitely did it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, all the, all the crazy stuff that went down that leads me to believe that he 100% did it, uh, is a fascinating story in itself, but it's not necessarily that's something that's related to, to UFOs or necessarily the Sphinx. But, um, anyways, kind of just going on off on a tangent here. Uh, all right. MT motors from the movie was the car dealership. He went he wanted to open in movie, probably not accurate, but for movie entertainment. My cousin was in Phoenix when those lights hovered over him. Uh, damn. Yeah. Speaking of the Phoenix lights, like every, because I'm in Phoenix, whenever I meet people who tell me they've lived here ever since the nineties, I always ask them, did you see the Phoenix lights? And surprisingly, I've met a couple of people who claimed that they saw them. Um, but I, I still don't necessarily even know what to make the, of the Phoenix Lights myself, particularly because it was, I guess if you're looking at the rating of close encounters of the first kind, second kind, third kind, or fourth kind, it was, although a mass sighting, only a close encounter of the first kind. I guess I'm realizing that's probably why it's not as fascinating or the story around it isn't as deep as something like the Travis Walton encounter, which was a close encounter of the fourth kind. So the first kind is 
you just see something in the sky. Second kind is you see something in the sky, but there's also physical evidence. So maybe it lands and leaves impression marks or something, or maybe it like shoots a flame that leaves a burn mark on the ground, or it crashes and it leaves this fucking just like trail where the debris like dragged as it crashed into the earth, right? So that would be a close encounter of the second kind is there's a physical uh, piece of evidence to support the sighting. Uh, the third kind is when you see beings associated with the craft so like roswell if people claim that there were dead aliens found right that would be a close encounter of the third kind or like the socorro new mexico case that i released two videos ago um that would be something that's like a close encounter of the third kind because he saw two beings so anyways close encounter of the fourth kind is when someone gets abducted uh like travis walton and so the phoenix lights was despite something that thousands and thousands of people saw it was only a close encounter of the first kind therefore i think that's why the story about it is not as compelling as something like travis walton although it is fascinating that so many people saw this thing and also the sheer size of whatever this thing was um and, and that's also been a line of debate when you look at the the phoenix lights is just they say this thing was like two miles wide right so it's like that big ship from the movie independence day um, but the only thing is you could only tell how wide it was because the lights seemed to be a part of one giant craft but i've also seen other reports that it seemed like the lights were um maybe multiple craft flying in, in formation and so if it was a large cra large craft or multiple craft Either way, the fact that so many people saw it is fascinating in itself. Um, but as far as like what, what's interesting about it, other than like the fallout from the government governor of Phoenix, Arizona, or like the area who denied the whole thing, um, and, and really, even though he saw it, denied that it was extraterrestrial or anything even happened. Um, I think what's what's not. I, I guess what's the one plot hole around it for me is that there's very little evidence or even like documents or whistleblowers that have talked about the military response and or lack thereof. Like I would be curious to know if they picked it up on radar. If so, did they know what it was? Were people freaking out? You know, like kind of like the TikTok UFO, Tic Tac UFO that was seen. Um, you know, that has had this ginormous fallout all these whistleblowers the the radar uh data was mysteriously deleted or removed from the files uh, or the hard drives that of the machines on the ship of the carrier around the tic tac ufo video some people don't know that's that aspect of the story and then fravor is convinced that this thing was extraterrestrial right and so um you don't get a lot of that stuff with with the phoenix lights you just get a lot of local civilians seeing something and, and that's it you know and, and and so in that aspect it's hard to find a story angle for that but a very fascinating uh case in itself nonetheless he was a freshman in college that time frame said there was pure silence not a sound when it went over him didn't have he didn't have a camcorder then Oh, well, no cell phone cam either. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, I, I'm i by the Palm Springs, California area. Oh, so that's kind of close to where, you know, Eisenhower apparently shook hands with the extraterrestrials. I was driving at night in a deserted area and seeing a UFO looking thing. The white beam was super bright and shot straight up. I knew it was something out of this world world due to the fact that the dust kind of followed uh how fast the ship shot up it's awesome man that's crazy what up tj anderson all right guys what are you guys what what is your favorite story within the the ufo uh phenomenon um and i'm curious like have you guys have you heard about the travis walton story in the past um or was this video either this live stream or the or the video i released yesterday was that the first time you'd heard the story um 
I think for me, when I had heard the story, it it was fascinating. It was an intriguing story. I thought it was cool that he was still alive and he was giving a talk at the MUFON meeting. Um, but it was something that I didn't really consider the emotional experience of until very recently when I started working on this video uh, because, you know, when I rewatched the the documentary that he actually put out um, with a group of filmmakers, uh, he released, I believe it's called Travis. Um, a lot of the interviews that uh, were used in my video that I clipped to um, were sourced from that documentary, right? And so um, very fascinating documentary. And what was most interesting to me as I watched it again for the first time in a while uh, in the making of my own video about the, about the story, um, is that it was a very scary experience. You know what I'm saying? Like, it seems fascinating and you almost like wish like, man, I wish I could have been on that ship too. Or like, how crazy is that, that you got to like be on an alien spaceship and meet these beings? Like that would have been so interesting. But when you're, when you hear the fear in his voice, like, in the video, I intentionally left a lot of his pauses in between of in between his words as he's recollecting the story of what happened to him on the ship. I did that because I want you to be able to hear the fear and the trauma in his voice as he's recollecting what happened. Um, to me, as I really try to put myself in his shoes as I was going through the story, it it's it was a scary experience, you know, which. From that aspect, I can understand why the Fire in the Sky directors or whatever maybe thought, okay, let's let's make the the ship experience very scary and like this monster attacks him or whatever. <laughs> um, even though that's not quite what happened, but I think the emotional experience, I mean, it had to have been just as emotionally traumatizing. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh I mean, people can't go to sleep at night after watching a movie that scares them. Imagine living a fucking horror movie in, in real time and not knowing what to make of it. And your life basically has changed for the rest of your life, right? Uh, as well as the people who were friends with you or associated with the experience. Um, so yeah, very scary experience. And so when when we went to edit, me and the, ed the editor who... Uh, I've been working with lately who uh, edited edited this video. One of our goals was how do we convey that traumatic emotion in the in the video as you're experiencing it? You know, can you actually be scared going through the series of events too? And that that was one of the goals of the video. So let me know if you've seen the video, like if that's something that you also felt coming through was just how scary this experience must have been. <clears throat> wasn't there a movie based on his experience yep that's the exact one that we, uh i've been talking about uh at times and it's called fire in the sky um it might be on amazon prime check it out it's a really good movie i, I recommend it um especially if you've already seen my video and you understand the experience and, and you understand the actual story of what really happened i think all of that makes it even more fascinating to see how so many of the details felt like what may have actually went went down like to the letter um other than what happened while he was on the ship um you know i think one of the most compelling scenes of that movie is the scene where he gets hit by the beam of this flying saucer um because that is what actually happened you know so that part of the movie was very accurate uh and, and so check it out it's called fire in the sky Oh, he already found it. <laughs> uh, Fire in the Sky, 1993. I was three years old. First time heard the story and it was super interesting. Great stuff. Awesome, man. You know, that's also what's fascinating to me because I've got a whole Rolodex of interesting UFO stories that I could easily tell in a video on my YouTube channel. But it's almost like when I go to sit down, and think what is the next video i want to make uh at this point i already know like what at least the next two or three videos are um but 
it's almost like there's so many fascinating ones that I overlook the best ones because I go, oh, most people have already heard about that. I don't need to make a video about that, right? And I've reframed that thought in my head recently to, oh, most people know about that. I should make my own video about that because most people will be actually interested in watching a video about that because they've actually heard about it. So that's something that I, from a YouTube strategy standpoint, I've had to realize. Um, but, uh, you know, I just assumed that Travis Walton was such a well-known story because of the movie, because of his Joe Rogan uh, podcast or whatever. I was like, everybody already knows the story. The story's played out like the Bob Lazar story. I assume that about the Bob Lazar story. The story's played out. Nobody needs to see another video about that, right? But I'm also equally fascinated that every time I bring up Travis Walton or Bob Lazar, nine times out of 10, the person who I bring it up to has not heard about it. And that's what fascinates me. So I put out the video, assuming it's still like a part of me was like, people have already heard this story, but it's really cool to see that you have not heard the story until this video came out. Now you know the story. And so what's cool about that is now you got the this video to watch, the live stream, the video that this live stream is kind of based off of to watch. Uh, you've also got the documentary that Travis Walton put out to watch. And you've also got the Hollywood movie that was put out to watch. And so you got a lot of places to dig into um, if you're interested in this story. Um, but I here's what I here's what I think is most interesting. And I told you I don't want to spoil a lot of the details about what happened to him on the craft, but the two beings that he encountered, as I said earlier, the Grays and the Nordics. So anytime you look into any people who claim they've met extraterrestrials, you know, you'll see a through line of people who say that these beings looked like these tall, lanky, long, skinny, not muscular, no sex organs, just a large almond shaped eyes and a small mouth and a big head, right? The classic gray alien being. So that's a, that's a through line. That's a pattern everywhere uh all over the place between people who've seen claim they've seen extraterrestrials right so that's fascinating another one of those through lines that's completely separate is these nordic beings and the nordic beings typically are associated with being dressed in like these blue spacesuits um maybe they're wearing a helmet maybe not but they have bright blonde hair bright bright blue eyes um kind of like the aryan race which is an interesting aspect of what I was talking about earlier, which is the Nazi wonder woman, wonder weapons that they were being, that they were making. And they apparently got these weapons uh, through telepathic communication, which allowed them to like document the, the blueprints of how to make these things um, from these beings from the star system, Aldebaran. And if you look into that, the planet that they're from there's their race of people are known as the Aryan race. So if you actually look up the origins of the Aryan race, the word that Hitler was so obsessed with, um, it's, it's up for debate where the actual source of that word came from. But one of the sources is from this Maria Orsic girl who was uh, essentially the leader of one of these occult groups that the Nazi party party was made of one of the core fundamental groups that combined with a series of other groups to make up the Nazi party. Right? So this bitch who was also happened to look very airy in herself, very beautiful woman at the time, by the way, too, still even by today's standards, gorgeous. Um, she was communicating with these things. She's the one who wrote down all these blueprints. And so, the source of Aryan, the word, came from these beings that were apparently telepathically communicating. And so that's interesting because the Aryan features that are very Nordic in appearance. And so that's why these things are known as the Nordics. So they have bright blue hair or blonde hair, blue eyes. They look like just really good looking, regular ass people. Uh, and, and so... Yeah, interesting. A lot of interesting connections. And so if there's anything to the fact that 
maybe the Nazis, the World War II Germans, escaped to Antarctica, have this whole spe secret space force. We're communicating with these Aryan ra the Aryan race, thinking that they must have been descendants of the Aryan race, which is why they were so obsessed with it. Um, if there's any truth to that, you would understand why the government might step in and be like, hey, I don't mind if you make a story about Travis Walton getting abducted, but can you edit the Nordics out of the story just for national security purposes? I could easily see that happening. And so uh, very, very interesting if you ask me. Um, love how NASA government has an excuse for video they've released leaked by someone that defy physics. Love the video of the UFO refueling by the sun also. Yeah, man. Um, when I was considering making this YouTube channel, um, that one video of the sun getting something, this plasma sucked out of it by a Jupiter-sized spherical UFO the size of Jupiter. Comprehend that. I think Jupiter can fit almost 2,000 planet Earths inside of it. That's how large it is, okay? This thing was the size of Jupiter, and it zipped away from the sun in an instant after... Instant! <laughs> after uh, sucking plasma out of it <laughs> for multiple days. Uh, pause. Uh, for multiple days and zipping off in an instant. And that being a leaked NASA video, like actual NASA footage, is what fascinated me so much about the UFO uh, topic to where I was like, one, if you try to find that video in itself is hard to find on the internet, which means nobody's talking about it, which blows my mind because why is nobody talking about it? Which is why I had to make my video about it because it's the most fascinating UFO footage I've ever seen. Um, and NASA scientists, well, they'll, they'll claim that it's a, it's a magnetic bubble called the prominence and it's a very common occurrence. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. That's your theory. My theory is it was a spaceship refueling. <laughs> All right. And until we have more evidence, uh, which seems to me like there's equal evidence for both theories, uh, potentially, um, I'm not going to decide what it is or isn't, but I'll let you decide after seeing the video, if you know what I mean. Um, there was also one show on Netflix, Unacknowledged, that was pretty good too and really interesting. You know what's interesting about Unacknowledged? I believe that is the Stephen Greer uh, show. And Stephen Greer has a couple of decent documentaries out there, but um, I've met a couple of people who are active in the UFO community um, specifically the, the lady who's in charge of Arizona MUFON. I mean, that's a pretty legit title. If you ask me, um, she's had dinner with Stephen Greer and a group of other people, uh, who are like these UFO people. I've interviewed people who've been on shows like ancient aliens and a number of other, uh, mainstream documentaries. Um, I don't think I've posted a hundred percent of these interviews. Like I haven't posted my interview with the uh, Stacy Wright, who's in charge of all of Arizona MUFON. Um, that one's just on my Patreon. Um, but I, I filmed it a couple of years ago. So if I wanted to post it on my YouTube channel today, uh, I would have to go through and make sure that there's nothing that's super outdated uh, with that interview. I mean, if you would want to see that video posted, I'd be happy to post it, but I just almost wonder if it'd be too outdated to post today. Um, but anyways, more of the story is I've met a number of people who have interacted with Stephen Greer in person and they all claim that he uh, is very arrogant, narcissistic, only cares about himself, is only out for a profit. Um, and it seems like they don't have a lot of respect for this guy. So I, I don't know what to tell you about Stephen Greer. I think he has a couple of good do documentaries out for sure. I also think he has a couple of but like nonsense BS documentaries that were clearly just put out as a cash grab. Um, but that's a whole other story. Uh, and, and so I don't know. He seems legit. He seems like he knows people in the government, but, uh, yeah, I guess take that with a grain of salt, take it how you will. Um, 
I don't know his true motives. I don't know if this is just a, uh, you know, um, there's obviously incentive to putting out content around this, right? Um, and so one thing that he likes to talk about is what he calls close encounter of the fifth kind, which is being able to use telepathic communication to get these UFOs to show up on command, right? And then he also charges $5,000 per person uh, to take you out and do this with you. Um, and I've talked to people who have done that and they say something weird happens, but they can't see it, tell if it's aliens or not. Um, which leads me to believe it could all just be one big circus show with that guy. Who the fuck knows? So um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, that's insane. Makes the death star look like a golf ball. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about the Death Star, um, and I want to do a video about this in the future, um, but the video would be kind of similar to my moon video where it's not necessarily an alien or UFO video, but more uh, mind-blowing and intriguing objects in space. Uh, and one of those is a moon of Jupiter that I believe is different from the moon that of Mars Phobos that has a big uh, monolith on it that Buzz Aldrin has talked about. Um, <laughs> you need to refer to uh, my video about the UFO on Mars for more information about that. But um, I almost forget I made that video. That's a great video too. Um, but anyways, there's a moon of Jupiter that has this ridge along the equator of the moon that's very noticeable making the entire thing look like a ginormous acorn and it could also kind of be a death star if you think about all the anomalies of why it would be shaped like that like that ridge at the equator of this thing is apparently like two or three miles high it also looks like an artificial seam around the equator like someone welded this thing shut and so a lot of theories around the weird anomalies of that moon uh lead some to believe that maybe it's a death star like ship um there's also reports of this random ufo floating around inside of the the rings of saturn you know that's a fascinating one along with the ufo that is preventing russia from landing anything on the planet mars it literally shoots all of mars's satellites and rovers out of the atmosphere before they're able to make a safe landing on the surface of the planet mars that's basically the plot of the mars uh video that i was talking about earlier that's one of my earlier videos my computer's about to die so i should probably plug that in uh, glad i noticed that Let's see how close I was before I noticed that. 10%. Um, so yeah, uh, but also if you watch the moon video, the moon might be a death star in itself. Um, I mean, the whole theory about that moon video is the intriguing anomalies, kind of like all the anomalies of like the pyramids or the Sphinx. Like there's just so many weird synchronicities and crazy facts about the moon that make you wonder is it an artificial satellite that was placed in orbit to maintain the stability of earth in order to facilitate breeding maybe an advanced species as a genetic experiment uh you know there's there's a lot of interesting theories around that uh, again i don't know what to make of any of it but one of my goals with the moon video was to make you guys feel how I feel, which is now knowing what I know about the moon. I can't not look at the moon and wonder, is this just a Death Star? Silently watching, always, waiting for its opportunity to strike. And it makes you really just 
second guess every time you look at the moon in the sky. And my goal when I started editing that video was to make everybody who watches that video second guess the moon every time they look in the sky. And if and if you if I've allowed you to be able to do that, uh, then that video will have succeeded. And there's a re I mean, that intention going into that video is probably why it blew up on social media. Like on my YouTube channel, I think it has 90k views, but that is light work compared to what it did on TikTok and Instagram. On TikTok, I believe it did close to 10 million views. Um, and on Instagram, I believe it did 4 million views. So, uh, crazy, crazy video. And I think my video coming out, if not next week, then definitely the week after. I think we're probably about seven to 10 days out from this next video being posted. Uh, assuming that Thanksgiving is not a major distraction. Um, I think that video has another, I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil the, the, you know what? Fuck it. It's about the great pyramid of Giza. I think that video has the potential to be equally as mind blowing. So, um, that's something to look forward to. All right. Didn't they say the moon dings like a bell? Really? Why take this long to go back, et cetera? Exactly. You know, I don't know the entire details around. I mean, there's a lot of conspiracies around what caused the Apollo uh, missions to end. Um, but to answer your question, yes. Essentially, when they launch back into orbit around the moon so they could return to Earth, um, the, the lunar lander, when it is in space, it separates much as the ship does as it leaves Earth's atmosphere. And the bottom part is supposed to crash land into the surface of the moon, whereas the actual pod with the people goes back to the ship and then they return to Earth, right? And so um, essentially on one of the missions, they decided, well, let's measure the seismic activity of the moon by placing all these seism uh, seismic measuring devices uh, seismometers um, on the surface of the moon spread out by several miles apart or whatever and we'll just measure it as the thing crash lands into the surface of the moon and hits the moon right so they did an intentional and controlled crash landing of this part that separates off the lunar lander um, and they did this multiple times but each time they did it what was very surprising is that when it hit the moon the moon and its outer core shell, it reverberated like a bell for hours, for like three to six hours each time they did it, right? And so that's one of the things that leads people to believe that maybe the moon is hollow. And what's also fascinating is that when they would drill into the moon, they the drill would always stop working when it got to a certain depth and when it got to a certain depth uh you know they couldn't get past it and so they were basically measuring the the composite uh like the, the composition of these lunar rocks the space dust that's on the moon's surface as well as as deep as they can drill or whatever and what they were getting in return like what they were finding it was all made of is like these rare elements of rare metals that are rarely found on earth right but are just like hard rare metals you know um i don't remember the specific ones i would start naming off random metals like <laughs> but i don't want to i don't want to butcher it because uh you know i i listed the specific ones in in the video um so anyways, a lot of random evidence pointing to the fact that this thing is a hollow metallic sphere. Uh, what's inside is anybody's guess at this point. Um, but these are things that are actual data measured by NASA, but also denied by NASA. And so there's been multiple whistleblowers over the years saying that NASA intent, like they, they, they scrub all of their photos and videos and they try to cover up anything that may look weird or anomalous uh and they do this intentionally and they've been doing it for decades 
uh, whistleblowers have come out of NASA saying this. And um, what's funny is there's a popular girl on TikTok. I don't even like one of these, like NASA has a few people that they've hired and their sole job is to create content about space. And they have millions of followers on TikTok. And one of them, I think her name is like Astro Alexandria or something like that. Uh, she saw my moon video and was hating so hard on that moon video. And I asked her like what her opinion, like in a private DM, I asked her like what your, what her opinion on it was. And she was like super sassy and caring about it. She was like, seems like a fucking video that made this conspiracies. That's it. Just conspiracies. But these are all, <laughs> these are all NASA data that NASA measured. So you're going to fucking deny that NASA has this shit. Okay. Not to say that she would even know. But there's a reason she's the face because she's the con it's all conspiracies. Like they get they take a certain archetype of people. I think it's no wonder <laughs> that all the all the social media creators that NASA has hired are very liberal women. Okay. I don't think that's a, I don't think that's by accident. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh can't wait. I love the pyramids. Uh I can't wait to release that video too. I think it, I have high hopes for it. I think at least for me, I'm equally as mind blown by the pyramids as I am about the moon, the Sphinx. Um, and so being that those are two of my more popular videos, not just on my YouTube channel, but across the entire internet, uh, I hope you guys enjoy the, the pyramids video. So that's, that's going to be the next one coming out soon. Uh, there was also a video of a satellite orbiting the moon and there was smoke or vapors exiting the surface, kind of like a power plant. Yeah, that's true. Like what? First off, the moon is not supposed to have atmosphere. So, you know, I think there was some debate around like, why can you see the smoke like that um, or something like that? But also. Like what could possibly be ejecting steam <laughs> out of out of the moon? Um, and, and if you look into the moon and I didn't really hit on any of this stuff, uh, in the moon video, because I think that would deserve it's, it's deserving of its own video because it's a large enough topic, but structures that have been found on the moon. Um, if you look at the structures that have been photographed on the moon many times, and then look at some of the, the earlier versions of that picture and some of the later versions of that picture it's clear that a lot of shit has been photoshopped out which i think i've shown in one of my videos that it like even if you don't even know how to use photoshop really it's as simple as like pressing one or two buttons to 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 cover a blemish and a, on a zoomed out photo of a of a of a moon i could easily cover up a, a blemish that is actually a building or something like that. Uh, and so there's been so many photos and videos of structures that are like skyscrapers or like exhaust pipes that look like they run two miles straight up into the air or satellites that are so large that have a dish shape and a thing poking out of it that point up into the sky. Like, and these things are ginormous in scale. Like you think of a little satellite dish that as like something that's like maybe 20, 30 feet tall. No, like these things are a mile fucking tall. Uh, so these things have all been photographed on the moon. Bob Lazar, if you believe Bob Lazar at all, he's talked about having a having a running bet with one of his colleagues about if the moon uh, has structures on it. And then he ended up losing the bet because they found a video or uh, they found a photo that were very obviously structures on the moon um uh, yeah a photo of that and he lost the bet and he admits that and so um yeah there's a lot of weird things that go on with the moon um but anyways guys i've been going live for an hour and a half i'm not sure if you can tell that my voice is like i'm pretty tired uh and it's just a reflection of how much work i've been doing behind the scenes uh the last week or two and so even yesterday releasing this video i couldn't even go live yesterday after releasing the video because i was so exhausted and so uh yeah i'm a little bit lower energy today 
but hopefully this was enjoying to you guys. Um, and like I said, every time I post a video, which hopefully is going to start being literally a lot more consistent, hopefully every one or two weeks at this point, um, uh, we're going to be going live after all of that. So um, enjoy. Talk to you guys soon. If you haven't seen the, the Travis Walton video yet, go watch it now, and I will see you when the next video drops. Peace out.